Good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, Art at Said. Tonight, we're delighted to be launching the exhibition for Julian Wilde, um, who is a very respected sculptor. And you may know him for a really large-scale commission that he made outside the Big Data Institute here in Oxford, and it's showing on the screen to the side. Um, we're delighted that um, Julian's put together this body of work for us. And um, it's here in conversation today with Kate, Kate Bryan who is head of collections, if I'm right, at Soho Farmhouse, and you may also, or Soho Group worldwide, yep. and also um, known for being the Sky Arts, um, the Sky Arts presenter. So thank you very much for coming today. Um, the exhibition is called Janus. I don't know if I've said that correctly, but it's to do um, with looking forward and looking back. And one of the things that really struck me was thinking about this exhibition is how, you know, we think about art here in relation to the business context. And uh, as running a business, it's quite good to look back at the past year and think about our successes, what's worked, what hasn't, and to think about how we can be creative looking forward. And it's really wonderful to have Julian here today to enlighten us more about his exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to start with just a few thank yous, if that's okay. Yeah, you should we... do it before you forget later, exactly, then you're embarrassed. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so initially I just wanted to say, um, so it's, it's a long process sort of making an exhibition like this, um, and I sort of disappeared into the studio for a long time, so uh, just very grateful to my wife Mary for sort of uh, putting up with those uh, times when I'm away working. Um, George and Lily, I wanted to thank them for all their help with this um, project. Um, uh, so um, also David and all the maintenance team here at the at Said Business School have been absolutely fantastic, bringing the work in, lighting it. Um, it was quite a complex in installation that took a few days, so very grateful to them. Um, obviously Kate for agreeing to take part in this event. Um, and, um, and also wanted to thank the Said Business School for this opportunity. Um, it's an interesting one because actually um, a number of years ago I came here as an art handler to hang um, an exhibition of Frank Hamill, who's just sitting there. Um, and uh, I, I thought it was such a fantastic building. So I knew about the building as soon as it was mentioned to me. And I, I was really, really pleased to be asked to, to do a show here. Um, uh, and of course, thank you very much to Lizzie for um, inviting me to do the exhibition and for um, curating it. Um, yeah, so that's my that's my thank yous well done. done. There you go. Very good. And yeah. if you were missing from the thank yous, he'll add you at the end. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. So we should start with the title of the exhibition. I'm actually going to be mean and go with the hardest question first. Okay. Sorry, Julian. All right. I refused okay. to rehearse this with him earlier on because I said no, I, I don't like it because I want I don't want the answers to be stale. So I am giving him the hardest question okay. first, and he didn't realise this. But this exhibition title is fantastic. So you're you've used the um, Greek Roman god Janus, who is the sort of the god of transition of time of beginnings of endings as a way of looking at your own practice so the exhibition includes work which proves pre-existing older work and work that you have come back to you know a lot of artists given this opportunity to have effectively what could amount to a bit of a mini retrospective would kind of go one of two ways they would have this big ego and be like look how great I am look at this amazing career I've had and leave it as it is or they might do what Picasso did and absolutely you know real in horror at the big R word because of course if you have a retrospective then people sort of historicize you they cement everything you did in the past in time and they say this is Julian Wilde in 2005 and here he is in 2011 and they put you in this kind of continuum and what you've done is kind of completely flip that and actually say I'm interested to look at these works, to think about them again, and almost have a conversation with yourself mm. uh, and the kind of work that you've made. So what I want to know okay. is what have you learned about your work? Oh I know, so <laughs> mean. Um, I think, what, what have I learned about my work? Um, I think well, through, through doing this, I think I'd, it's, it's given me a kind of, um, a sort of, I suppose, a bigger overview of my practice. And it was more about maybe just thinking about how I how I approach the work as a whole. So, you know, previously I've made um, outdoor exhibitions where I've, you know, had a number of pieces and they've kind of gradually collected over time. Mm. Um, and I think it was more, actually, maybe it's not so much learning about myself, learning about the work, but learning about myself, I think. So, so actually kind of revisiting and going back to these earlier works. And I'm actually sort of having a conversation with myself at that point in time. So there's, so something like Salvia, which has become Salvia Corrupted, which we'll see later on. Um, you know, that was made in 2000 and 
12 and I'm a very different person now to mm. who I was then and it's about those... Your studio's completely different now, sort of life setup is different. So are, yeah. you, are you almost nostalgic sometimes when you're thinking back to these works and thinking, oh, I made it like that or I was a bit like that, I mean... No, it's not nostalgic because I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of... It's the opposite almost. I'm reworking it, so I'm just kind of changing it, so I'm making it better. It's like I want to... And it's, you know, we were talking earlier, it's really interesting actually that I can, that then maybe this isn't the point where they will stop. Mm. So maybe I'll keep changing things. You yeah, know. we had a nice conversation earlier about the idea that um, for artists it's quite normal to want to change your work, you know, or actually go back and destroy early works. We were saying how um, Bacon used to love to try and find anything that predated the three figures at the base of the crucifixion because for him that was his career. And it's this amazing idea of being able to mould your career to your own liking and say, well, everything I did before then doesn't count. And find it and destroy it or do what Picasso did actually and have his retrospective but put in all new work and don't and refuse to put it in a chronological order so mm. you take everything out of order and you sort of mix it all up yeah. and show that you've still got loads of new ideas and lots of interesting things are happening and actually make the rose period or the blue period more dynamic by showing them next to the March news for example yeah. but it's um it's a really interesting prospect because you don't seem sort of emotionally kind of weighted to these earlier works. I mean, I sometimes get nervous taking a dress to the tailor that right. I really like. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I'm curious, like, you, it's like Salvia is like a, you know, this piece here, yeah. without the blobs, as you call them, um, yeah. is a, you know, it's a really key work. It's a yeah. serious bit of kit. And it and used it's been to... shown in a, a you know, exactly. sensibly. Yeah. And, but then it's boring to just keep, for me, to just keep showing yeah. it. And, mm. and the other thing I love about, you know, so for example, like I was always interested in, um, how Howard, Howard Hodgkin works. So he'd do a, a kind of, you know, he'd have his studio and he'd work on one piece, you know, several pieces at the same time. Mm. And he'd come, you know, he'd kind of come back to these pieces over a period of years. Yeah. And I love that whole thing of the date as well, sort of, you know, so you can add in sort of 2012 to 19. Yeah. And it sort of, it kind of has that whole, um, there's a there's a whole narrative there basically yeah. to do with time, but. but it feels very much a sort of decision or a kind of thing that's cemented in the artist world because I think maybe the art going public are less familiar with this idea of reincarnation of artwork or artists destroying the artwork or changing the artwork or kind of modifying it later. And we were talking earlier on about one of the things that happened last year, which maybe will change everyone's opinion of that, which of course is Banksy, who took all artwork which now no longer exists and made it into a totally different artwork. So the the original artwork only exists now as a photograph yeah. and the new artwork is something completely different. Um, I wondered if there was any artwork that you, not just because you couldn't get your hands on them because they were sold or whatever, but that you just thought, I mustn't touch it. Did you feel that there were any that, which were in some sort of sanctuary of your mind? Um, it depends, yes. I mean, so if, I think it's also to do with the practicality. So I've got, you know, the ones that I could, were available that I could, yeah. could get hold of. So not not able to get them back from people who but bought them. But if I gave you permission to do anything to any of your previous works, are there, are there works that you would just be like, no, I'm done? I wouldn't. I think probably the the commission for the Big Data Institute yeah. in Oxford, that piece, <laughs> I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to change <laughs> yeah. it. I kind of felt like that was like this, that was a piece that made me think about doing this show because it was kind of felt like these, you know, there's this kind of rigid geometry and then it mm. gives way to these kind mm. of more organic elements and it's sort of, um, it's all about that, that kind of change. Um, so there's something that's austere and, yeah, yeah, there's something austere and expressive in there. Yeah. So I feel like this piece, I don't, I don't think I could make it better. You couldn't emphasize it anymore. I mean, no. it's the perfect expression of one of the things that really interests you, which is Nietzsche and his, you know, the relationship between Ap Apollo and Dionysus yeah. and the rational and the irrational, as so amazingly put in his Birth of Tragedy. And he says that, you know, it was Greek tragedy that really nailed it, that got the kind of the, the, the wild and the frenetic and the kind of the, the craziness and actually mm. blended it perfectly with the rational and the sensible and the constant and the steady. Um, and I mean, that plays out in so many of your works. If you just take a piece like this yeah. or even this, you know, the way that you allow these kind of very industrial, well-known materials to do things they're not really supposed to do in this kind of uh, these irrational shapes which seem so intuitive i mean do you think it's really at the heart of what you do that duality between apollo and dionysus i think so i think it's um it, it's explicitly now there i think previously i'd, I'd make a, a type of work and then i'd flip and do another type of work so mm. i'd you know i'd sort of do these commission projects which were were very much um you know kind of ordered pieces um, and and then I'd make more studio-based work, which is which is much more expressive in glass or ceramic, and I, I kind of always wanted to connect the two, basically. 
Um, so, and then added to that, there's also this element of like of being an artist, where it's is something that Mary, my wife, always talking about. Is this you have this kind of self-destruct button, so you <laughs> you kind of blow things up and reinvent yourself, and every mm. so often you have to do that. Um, yeah. And do you find that sometimes comes out of mistakes? Because I imagine with a practice like yours, you do actually have to use intuition. You do, you can't necessarily plan everything. I mean, with a large-scale installation work, it's been planned. Mm. I would imagine down to a very finite detail, but to the kind of work that you're making in your studio with your hands, is there an element there for surprise being caught out for finding a beautiful accident? Yeah, I always try and I try and factor that in. So actually, even with the larger commission pieces, the like the the, the piece yeah. in Oxford that wasn't the middle bit wasn't designed. It was made intuitively. So, really? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really impressive. So the structure was and it still set. stands up. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's still there. I think. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you have a real um, fondness for materiality. There's a lot of sculptors that play with the idea of medium and the actual material, and they try and sort of disguise it or take the viewer to another place where they're not even necessarily really thinking about material. Mm. But you never seem to really shy away from the kind of materials that you use. I mean, I could imagine you'd be quite happy if I left you for an afternoon in a scrapyard. You, you kind of, you like these metals, you like finding these steels. Mm -hmm. I and mean, you've worked in loads of different things, glass and wood as well. Yeah. But I get the sense that you're, you're never trying to conceal these things entirely, that like, you, you're very much attracted to the physical aspect of them. Yeah, I think there's a balance though there between, so working with, I mean, metal is a, I, I love metal, um, and I'm sort of, you know, working in bronze and stainless steel, because you can, you can do so much with it. It can mm. become, it can be like clay, or it can be like wood, it can, you know, it can, you can change it and do do whatever you want with it. But um, um, I think there's always a bit of a balance for me between kind of getting things to such a finish and such to such a point um, that they might lose the quality of the material. You know, so you can kind of go too far with it. So yeah. it's that balance of of having that history of making in there is really important to me. So yeah, because you've got there's definitely very much a process which is explicit in the work. You've described yourself as sort of doodling in 3D, and actually that's nice timing. Your drawings have come yeah. up, um, and you do seem to me like a very exquisite drafts person who can kind of conjure these lines and then make them into 3D. Do you make a drawing for every one of your sculptures, or do you ever allow yourself the freedom to not have the drawing, or vice versa? Well, the sculptures are drawings, really. So I actually I, d I don't usually draw the sculpture before I make it. So I, I will, the drawings like a. Um, it, you know, when I'm making working, say, with a pencil on paper, that's mm. like a separate activity that can be about a sort of celebration of the enthusiasm that I feel for a piece of work, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily of it. So the works in the, in the exhibition are about kind of weightlessness in a way and, you know, things not having to connect. Um, I draw on the computer a lot as well, so I draw, you know, kind of um, explore ideas that way as well, so I can kind of change things and... Oh, really? So okay. most of, the, most of the, the sort of designing happens actually on... On a, on a computer program. Because I was interested to know how much you have a relationship with digital technology because you strike me as a real sculptor's sculptor. I mean, you, you're not sort of coming up with ideas and having every single thing in your studio fabricated by a million different companies around in eight different countries, yeah. which is a lot of conceptual artists that I work with do do that. Yeah. And actually a lot of artists I know are now working, having things 3D printed and working with, you know, really complex computer programs to kind of create even the shape and the sense mm. and the composition of what the artwork might be to make it even more you know compositionally impossible mm. but your work always gives me the sense of you i yeah. mean it feels like you're very much in there in the making of it so i was wondering how much you use digital technology and how much of a tool it is for you and how much you feel that you have to be a little bit well i don't know maybe yeah. this is my reading of it but i feel like sometimes for an art artist like you, I imagine with all of these developments, you must have to pick and choose what's going to be useful for you in order to keep you as your integrity as a sculptor yeah, intact. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's working. I work between. I've always worked between analog and digital, and I think actually it's quite interesting because I think people think that when you're drawing something on a computer that you just push a button and it does it, but actually you're, you know you need to know what yep. uh, the mechanics of mm. a of a form, and you need to to make it convincing. You kind of mm. I think you need to know how to to draw on paper anyway. Um, and the way that I work, I mean, a lot of the time I make pretty much all the work myself. So apart from the cast pieces, which are done in the foundry, but I'll make the original and then that, then I'll make yeah. a mold of that and then that gets, yeah. gets cast and then I'll do all the polishing. So I'm really aware of the materials and that, which point to take it to and mm. how far to go with the process. But I think it's just because I was, I was lucky enough to sort of go to, 
go to art college at a time when I think people, you know, it was very much about the materials and it was about, um, you know, that you can kind of, as a sculptor, you can kind of do anything. You can have a go at anything. And I love this idea that I can, you know, I get, I get a new piece of machinery and I'll start, you know, I can sort of start working in that process because, mm. because you can, you know, you can do it as a sculptor. Yeah. So. I mean, actually, I suppose it doesn't really happen like that for a painter. Like, you get a new piece of machinery and it might send you off in a different direction of making a different kind of work. Yeah. You could be sort of led by sort of the thing that's physically going to help you manifest your ideas. But it's the restriction. So as a sculptor, it's the restriction that I, I love. So mm. it, that, that I've got this idea and I want to get from A to B, but I can't because I've got to get through these materials. Mm. Whereas it's, I find it absolutely terrifying, the idea of having a brush with some paint on it and... You know, having to sort of just do something with that. <laughs> I have no idea what to do. I think uh, there's probably a lot of painters that would come to this exhibition and be terrified of how you would go about yeah, doing probably. this. So you always yeah. knew you wanted to be a sculptor when you were studying? Uh, no, I think originally I wanted to be a portrait painter. That was my... <laughs> that was a, wow. it was a long time ago. We would be having a very different conversation. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, the sculpture department just seemed really interesting and there was some great stuff going on, so mm. I ended up doing that. So you, did you think you found your voice a bit more easily within sculpture? Yeah, I think there's a thing about, I didn't realise, I think, you know, I can kind of think in 3D. Mm. I can sort of, you know, I can visualise things in 3D. And, mm. um, so yeah. when you knew you were having this exhibition, how, um, how did, did you know quite quickly that you were really happy to adapt existing works? Or did it come to you as you were making new things? That's what I think. I mean, it's, it's something that I'd had floating around in my head for a while. Um, and it started with the piece Splice, which is the red work mm -hmm. outside. And I knew that I wanted to, it wasn't enough having that work existing as it did, and I wanted to add to it. So that was a sort of starting point. And then I realised, well, actually, if I'm going to do this, I didn't want to just have, um, a, you know, a number of works that I've made in the past, and then I just kind of churn them out again, show them again. Some of the works needed repairing, they needed, you know, recoating. Yeah. So it was an opportunity to do that, really. And I mm. thought, let's really go for it with this and make yeah. it a, a body of work that's made over an, a long period of time. But I, I wanted to make sure that it all held together and that as you come through the show there's one piece leads to another and you can mm. see there's these kind of changes and developments happening. And one of the motifs which is new, which is these sort of lovely futuristic or, or sort of organic shapes, which are the great sort of silver blobs. Mm. The, the, what's salvia? Is, what's, what do you call it? Salvia now? Salvia corrupted. Salvia corrupted. So salvia is the, um, it'll come up in a minute, extraordinary big sculpture on the other side now. It looks like a perfect Christmas card covered in snow. Um, and it's now got sort of five or six of these silver, very happy looking squatters. And yeah. they're, they're sort of taken up residence. They've, they've sort of colonised it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's a new form for you. But it relates to other works that I've seen. And we have a beautiful work in Sarah House called Slab, which has got the same sort of like tactile quality, but doesn't have the same sort of organic shape. Mm. I mean, it seems at once to me that like it's like landed from out of space. It's really futuristic. The, 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 the futuristic, the polish on it is sensational. But at the same time, it looks like it could be like a, a molecular structure. Yeah. I mean, you're playing with that idea of... Well, we wanted that ambi ambiguity yeah. there. So, so they could be, you know, there's some of the images I've got on here of sort of uh, fungi on sort of uh, dying trees. And I was quite interested in the, in the rural context. So mm. the works were, you know, like this piece which we've got up now, that was, you know, um, felt to me too simple and I needed to kind of add to it. So I needed to kind of, it's almost like there's some, some, some kind of growth that's happened on it. Yeah. But when they're made um, originally, I think when you know, I showed Lizzie, they were um, made in wax and they kind of look quite abject. You know, they were pretty horrible looking things. And somehow when they become another material, when they become bronze or stainless steel and then are polished, there's this sort of strange um, kind of balance between it being a kind of slightly grotesque form, but actually the, the surface is so seductive. Yeah. So, yeah, you're yeah. really, really pulled in. And then, but also there's a precariousness to the way that you place things. I mean, there's always a slight precariousness in your work, the way that things strip down or the way that you balance things, where you put things on walls. Yeah. That, that we're always made to feel slightly that it's not that permanent. I mean, they never seem like big, heavy, macho sculptures. They feel that they've got a sort of... A, I mean, I asked you earlier on, is that quite light then? And you were like, no, it's really heavy. Yeah. And I was curious, but you know, like, what, like this, they sit on the wall. I mean, that just literally looks like a 3D doodle, yeah. which someone's pinned to the wall. But of course, there's a quite an amazing oh, amount of engineering. Oh, it's like a bit of wire that's yeah, just been exactly. twisted around. Yeah, um, but the, so, But then when you added these silver shapes as well, they all seem 
like if I came back five minutes later, they would move. I mean, they, they feel like organic that they're living, but yeah. yet they're on something which is like quite straight and rigid and it's okay. got geometry. I think with sculpture, I mean, there's a sort of stereotype that it has to be still. Mm. Um, and so I'm really interested in the suggestion of movement. And so when what happens when you get something, if you get this form, so there's a piece of clay and then you bend it, somehow it becomes animated mm. and that suggests that it's a, a, a it's living this structure. It's this piece we're talking about, yeah. 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 Um, the work in the corridor here, you've got some beautiful smaller pieces of sculpture. And I was saying to Julian earlier on that um, you, I came in and I caught the light and, and the snow as well. It was magnificent. And I was looking at all these large scale pieces outside. And then oftentimes what happens when you do that is you then go inside and see smaller pieces. And it's quite hard for those smaller sculptures to kind of fight their corner, just purely on the spaces of scale. And yet they're at, they have worked so well. And I think your work does have a really, um, a really, a real sensitivity to the human form standing in front of it. Mm -hmm. And we were asking, I was asking you earlier on how tall you were. And, and actually we realised a lot of your work is maximum your height. Yeah. So you want to have like a very physical, Relation, relational work to your sculpture. Yeah, well, I think really that you know, it's that that height, that 1.8 meters, is the mm. for me is the height where I want you know, it's that's Barbara what I'm playing Hepworth, with. Barbara Hepworth would have been delighted with that. She said, "Oh, what I would make if I was a foot taller." Yeah, yeah. Because it wasn't because she physically couldn't. It was because it was really important to her to have that mm. that relationship with scale. I think there's also the, the with so with these pieces like the stripping the willow pieces there's a sense that you know this column that's torn apart is bigger than me and I could never physically do that so there's mm. a kind of I'm I'm sort of playing with that yeah that that idea and that you know that it's the work is kind of stronger than me and yeah and, and it, it still works in, in the control. small ones though so the small ones in the corridor which I think are some of my favorite things in the whole church have become like that it's like you've they're like the crook of a finger here, or like a cigarette butt put out. I mean, there's just the form of them is so fantastic. This composition is so evocative, and it's, it sort of stands on its own. And then we lifted them, and they were so heavy. Yeah. I mean, they were like a real heavy piece of kit, like completely different to how you think about this part of your body, or putting, you know, the the sort of brutality of crushing a cigarette and bending it in half. That stub. Yeah. Um, where did that form and that shape come from? And were you conscious of scale and thinking about how it would work? Amongst all these other larger works, I think with those, well, I mean, those pieces in the in the, the sort of stainless steel pieces, they came from this this work here. So they yeah. came, that's where they emerged see, yeah. emerged yeah. from. Um, but it's that yeah, that kind of level of, of physicality. It's like it's something that um, you could just about hold in your hands. That mm. just about you know is, and it, the scale I think is important because it kind of reminds you of a sort of bend in your elbow or mm. you know that mm. that kind of. So there's definitely a sort of reference to the body there. Um, yeah. But it's also just, I just wanted to be able to be in that position where I'm making something that, that has that, it's, it's real, it's kind of convincing that, it, that you get something and you change it and then you cast it and, you f it, and then freeze it in another material. That's really mm. exciting for me. Yeah. You've used that word a couple of times, convincing, and I think it's a really interesting word, particularly to talk to a sculptor about because, as you say now, with digital programming, you can kind of sort of conjure anything you wanted in you know, virtual reality or 3D printing or any of these kind mm. of things, but your work is very much planted in this world with real materials. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is about making something which is convincing, which is so central to you? Um, I think it's because actually, well, in a way, uh, the pieces are about an illusion as well. Mm. There's a suggestion that they're, you know, they're not quite what they seem. So. Um, uh, say, say the question again. The so this word convincing, that like you want to make something seem convincing, because this is convincing as a Julian Wilde sculpture, but mm. it's not convincing anybody as a signpost or anything which is functional. Mm. So I, I understand what you mean, that you, there's a sort of authenticity to how you want to make your work, but you also are playing with this idea of um, pushing it, pushing the material in a different way, exposing the way that you make it, but also making it slightly transcendent. So you introduce these extraordinary colors that would never be in nature. Yeah. And so I think when you say that something is convincing, I just want to unpack that a little bit more because it's almost like that you need to have completely followed it through in your head as from this idea yeah. and then you want to manifest it this way. And I'm, I'm wondering, are you thinking that this is convincing because you didn't take any shortcuts because you got there 
by really thinking about how you were going to turn this deal into that shape? I think it's the, 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 the actual physical act. So mm. there's this action that happens. That's really important. That's what's convincing. And I want to, I don't want to be, I'm kind of very aware that I don't want to be making something that's like a kind of, uh, that's prop making. Yeah. You know, so it's like a fake, yeah. fake version of something. Yeah. So I don't really know. I don't. I no, don't have no, an answer because no, it's. I think. It's, I, think it's I think. I think it's just because your practice is probably so authentic <laughs> yeah. that it, it, for you, you're following a really um, a sort of detailed and nuanced set of principles for you to get from A to B, from this fant this idea that you've had to yeah. get these things to bend to your will to make this thing. Yeah. And of course, there's a million different ways you could do that. Yeah. There isn't just one way. But for you, it's almost like you need to find that one way. Am I, is, is yeah, that right? and I think actually I have, so I have a starting point mm. and, then, and there's a kind of end goal. And I kind of love where it just starts to go off course a bit. So, you know, for example, like the piece Ugly Fruit, which we've got outside, which is the, it's a vertical structure with a knot in it. This is the, the piece in the amphitheater. I'll see it later on. But the, the idea with that was really to make a, a vertical, get a vertical column and interrupt it. Mm. So to just tie it in a knot. And I had, didn't really have a plan what would happen. And it was a complete, you know, this really complicated thing to make, but mm. it's this sort of double knot in there and then it continues up vertically. So it's like this, it's like a set of rules and a, a set of challenges that I make for myself mm. that have really no point at all. You know, it's like this kind of... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like this. They do, because otherwise we wouldn't have sat <coughs> but, here really pleased with these artworks. I mean, but, I love, the point. but I love the banality of it as yeah, well. Yeah. I love the kind of pointlessness as well. Yeah. So. But I agree with you, that word is, is, is really true. It's like, this is, this is convincing. This is how, you know, you solved the problem of your own idea. You know, within its own world, it makes complete sense. Yes, and, yeah. And nobody else could come and do that in quite the way that you've done that. Yeah. You know, because that's the sort of authentic journey that you took. Right, yeah, yeah. I also wanted to ask you about the large commission, actually, the kind of challenges that you have making a piece like that. I mean, you seem, um, you don't seem very tortured. I speak to a lot of artists who have done like a big public commission or a big commission for a university, mm. and they t tell me about all the problems they encountered before they tell me about whether they're happy with it. Um, I mean, I'm sure there were challenges along the way, but you strike me as the kind of person who's not very shy or terrified or, or risk averse to taking on you know, these quite staggering things yeah. in terms of the, the prestige and the prominence and the scale of it. And also actually the kind of feat of engineering required, particularly for your piece at um, Oxford, I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, with the, with the Oxford piece, there was, the, there was support there mm. from um, the structural engineer and the fabricator who assembled the piece. But mm. um, so there's always, you know, there's, there's a point when I have to sort of say, well, I can't do this myself. I need to yeah. get some help with this. So there's that side to it. But no, I love the, I love the challenge. And that's what it's all about, really, is to be able to try and to do something on that scale was incredible yeah. because I could, you know, the whole point about it was that it's something you go underneath and you experience it you know, as physically you experience it. So, um, uh, but the, yeah, I mean, it was, it was full of loads of problems and loads of stuff that I had to sort of like <laughs> yeah. navigate and negotiate. And it and, was stressful, but- And also but there's, 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 there's conversations that you have to have, I mean, you've made a work which is in the city of London with Nat West. Yeah. I mean, you make those kind of works, they bring a whole set of different problems to doing an exhibition, to making work for your own pleasure. But of course, do you find that those challenges inform your practice? Like, do you come back having kind of gone and done this huge big thing which you weren't mm. entirely in control of because it wasn't necessarily, you didn't, you didn't entirely own the landscape within the artwork, yeah. you know, that the artwork existed in. But throughout doing that, do you find that you were like, well, that was a bit of a pain in the ass, but I'm really, really happy with the result. And actually what it has allowed me to do is bring this back to my work. I think ideally, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I teach at um, a place called the Art Academy in London and we have a project called the Commissions Project, which we've just done, where the students have to find a, um, get a commission. Um, they have to find a client and then they have to create this, this brief and mm. make a commission. And part of it is I find as I'm talking to them is, is actually to try and keep them, get them to keep the integrity of their practice yeah. whilst doing the commission. So there's that, that's a huge challenge, I think, for any artist doing a, mm. doing a public art project. And so I really try and, try and hold on to that and hold on to what, you know, so it's trying to further my practice and also kind of do something that I'm not expecting to do. And I think ideally you end up in a position where, like with this piece, you know, I, I ended up making something that I would never have thought of doing independently, but because mm. of the constraints of the space and 
the opportunity in the building, the yeah. architecture around it, the, you know, the fantastic make architect buildings and the work that went on in the centre, all of that kind of fed into this new piece that, uh, you know, came out of that, so. Yeah, and it was, so it sort of sends you in another direction, mm -hmm. but it all kind of works out quite nicely, even though that these things are sort of extremely challenging. I mean, yeah. you shouldn't really underestimate quite. Yeah, sort of things like the wrong size crane being sent, and we had to kind of sort of come back the following week to reinstall and right, you know, there's yeah. stuff like that. There's those yeah. challenges. But actually, when it's there in place, you kind of forget about no, all of that of stuff. Yeah. It's not quite the same scale, but installing a Soho house, which is so many moving parts, and it's a big organisation, it's a big hospitality company, yeah. no one cares about the art. Like, they're sort of standing looking at me as if I'm a mad woman, saying, why is this, like, eight days behind? I've got the yeah. artist arriving. Um, and, uh, but you, you always forget about that once the art's up and you're really happy with it and it's permanent and you see people enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about colour, okay? Because um, it, probably if you were a painter, we would have talked about colour sooner. Because you're a sculptor, we've spent a lot of time talking about ideas and materiality <coughs> and getting things physically made. Mm. But of course, you're a fantastic colourist, and you play with colour. You have a really joyful relationship with colour, and you're a bit of a master at it because you use a lot Thank of colours that are don't have that much business being in um, being in the kind of works that you make. And yeah. yet there they sit so happily. And uh, we were talking about like a convincing Julian Wilde. Yeah. I mean, it's colour and it's polish and it's finish. I mean, even when there isn't colour and you're working with the pieces that are just purely highly polished, mm. they just suck everything out, colour from everywhere else and light. Mm. Um, and I was interested to know where you get your ideas for colour and how much that's changed in the process of coming back and looking at these older works. Yeah. How you think about your relationship to colour has changed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of light and surface as well. I mean, I, I, the colour, um, partly, I think, is when you're working in an outdoor context where you've got a lot going on around you, the colour is this kind of really useful agent for kind of holding the viewer's attention yeah. in the space, so if it's, a, you know, the vibrancy of the colour. But then also I'm really interested in the history of sculpture and I'm interested in, you know, kind of modernist sculpture and the way that, you know, say someone like Anthony Caro would use um, red and the, the, the sculpture would then become, the material was basically red, really. It was yeah. kind of, so with the works I'm kind of revealing things, so I'm, I'm kind of either, you know... Um, yeah, you reveal colour in these. Yeah, yeah, so it's a kind of, it's a sort of fabrication, but that was the sort of, there was a relationship with that colour, was, there was a relationship to the copper colour of the, the roof of the building mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. um, and then also a relationship to it being bronze, but it's a, it's a kind of verdigris colour, but it's a fake one because it's powder coated. So there's this sort of different kind of games going on there, I yeah. suppose. Um, but in terms of the... The colours themselves, I mean, I have to kind of hold back sometimes with this red, you know, because it's kind of like I almost want to make everything that colour because it's just formally, I think it works so well with, yeah, I agree. with stainless steel. Yeah. It's like it's this living, bright, vivid colour mm. and the inside is this coolness. But they still manage to retain like a really strong relationship to nature and to things which are organic. Yeah. Even though that I never seen a leaf that purple or, you know, you yeah. use your, I mean, some of your colours go into territory which you might have got a bit of an acid tinge to them. Yeah. What was the, how did you describe the work in the city? Like a psych, did you call it a psychedelic? I, I call it a psych, yeah, I think, um, Psychedelic creeper. Yeah, yeah, in the Evening Standard, <laughs> yeah. selling it to London. I've made you a psychedelic creeper. Yeah, yeah. Um, but th these colours, though, you're not fearful of these colours whatsoever. I mean, they for you, they're just a sort of very natural part of your language. I think it's coming from a background as being a painter, so I, I, I kind of, I've always, I say, I think for a while, like after I finished, I did study sculpture at college, and then afterwards spent a number of years as a painter, so making these paintings, which. Fortunately, have all been destroyed. Yeah, now, now I'm so curious. Where yeah, are these? Yeah. So Why are these all, in this exhibition? But the colours, those colours are the same. It's yeah. like these are kind of acid colours, really. Yeah. So, um, and so I've always really been interested in how to kind of bring that into into form, and, and colour flattens it as well, which is quite mm. fascinating. So well, I was just going to come on to that because you you've taken earlier works and you've not just added to their form, but you've totally changed the colour of them. So with Salvia, it's now this fantastic pink colour, yeah. and originally purple. Yeah. And so how do you stand in front of the work this many years later, what, seven years later? Yeah. And say, right, I'm going to change it, I'm going to add these shapes, but also I need to change the colour. Well, because the colour, so salvia gets its name from a, from a, from a plant, and um, so the, the, it was the colour of the flower. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I was being really kind of strict with myself and using this purple that really matched the, the colour of the, of the plant. And then I thought, well, why, why am I doing that? And the, so I wanted to just... <laughs> basically make something that was really had such a kind of um, punch to it. But then also yeah. at the same time, it could be the same colour as a, you know, 
there's lots of you know these kind of colours, colour of a rhododendron. Yeah, or, you know course. they're in nature. Well, they are yeah. in nature, and that was what I think I wanted to say earlier on. Actually, when I was saying I've never seen them and leaf that colour ever, you realise that actually if you do stop and think about it, if I was in a rainforest, I'd be seeing these colours every single day. I just live in South London, that's why I'm not seeing them <laughs> yeah, in nature. Yeah. I haven't seen a tree for months. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And so you sort of remind us of the kind of sort of spectacular explosion that nature's, you know, possible of colour-wise. And also when you, when you, when you show work outside, the, the changing uh, the, the sort of backdrop changes, so you have kind of autumn colours and you know yeah. spring colours, and so it just. And for tonight, you lined up snow, which snow, was, which was yeah, yeah, hard to get in there, but yeah. we, we managed Excellent. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah and they, they look fantastic. Julian took his his Christmas card picture earlier on. Yeah. Um, finally, I wanted to talk to you about something that I learned about earlier on that I didn't know about and that you should have told me about. So okay. um, uh, it is called making the connection. Oh right, yeah. Which I yeah. love. We should do that at so our house. Okay. We're just going to have a private meeting now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us about Making the Connection. I think it's a really democratic, non-elitist, really interesting way of looking at art. Because I've been working in the art world a long time. I used to work at the British Museum. We used to run workshops. And we always had people come in and making art that weren't used to making art. Hmm. No one ever made sculpture. People always were introduced to making things through collage or through life drawing. And the idea that you're bringing in people who have not for necessarily from the art world. No, yeah, it's for uh, anyone, anyone. So, so even me, yes, I could come even and do you it. Could do it. Yeah. You could do it. Um, so it's um, a, it's a, a project um, basically made from plastic uh, plumbers piping. So it's elbow joints and lengths of piping, and I turn up at different venues and basically people can build whatever they want from this material. So it's like low tech, um, and kids love it adults love it it just seems mm. to really work as a kind of drop-in thing that people can build and a lot of the work that I've made came out of that because I, I was making more kind of ordered geometric structures and suddenly this kind of started doing this this process of, mm. of, of, of doing this so when I do an exhibition I do making the connection and um, this kind of linear free-flowing thing kind of came out of that so I've got a lot from it, and hopefully other people, have, you know, people so in a the sense public that the, have got from the it. public have no rules. They don't have their kind of rule book of how they make sculptures because they've not really done it before. So they no. just kind of go for it, and, and they then start, you borrow yeah. a bit of that. And it's interesting because they start off, so you get the dads with their sons, and the dads are sort of trying to. They're almost like they're trying to build a tent or something. Yeah. And the kids are just like, no, no, we're just going to do this, and we're going to go <laughs> yeah. over there, and yeah, exactly. it's, it's really liberating. And do you get people doing it all together? So they're making one mass shape together, yeah. or it varies. And then they, okay. and sometimes I've done it at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So many people were taking part. We had to take it. We had to take it apart a couple of times in the day to rebuild it because Fantastic. it was just like, yeah. So well, it's... I was going to ask if it actually had informed your practice. It sounds like it has. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to let you guys ask some questions. It's um, coming up to half past. But um, finally, um, I don't think it's a hard question to end with. But given that you've had this uh, sort of amazing experience of looking back at your earlier work and refashioning and rethinking them, I wondered if it has set off. Uh, a thought process of what's next. And I always like asking an artist what's next, but I want to know mm. what's next in the next few weeks, like what you're going to go back in the studio and do, okay. like w what you've kind of got an itching desire to make, and then also what's next, bigger yeah. picture, like how do you see, have you got any sense of what's going to happen in the next 10 years? I think, well, so the next, the next thing in the studio would be I've, I've been it's wood, so I've been collecting. Ah, oh, okay. I've been collecting a bit of a U-turn for yeah, what yeah, we've yeah. been talking so about I've been, today. I've been collecting yeah. wood for a number of years, and I've got so like all these salvaging wood, or yeah, but just all these different types. So like yew and oak, and mm -hmm. and so I was going to start a series of pieces in wood. I don't really know quite what yet, but okay. um, uh, so I bought myself a bandsaw, and I'm going to get going with that soon. <gasps> what a life! <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. And then the other side of it is I want to develop. Um, I want to do more installation-based work. So I've got an idea for a, a piece that's a kind of work that you can actually go inside that's made of stainless steel. So that's mm. the that's the next thing. Interesting. Okay, so changing our relationship with your work because at the moment we've got we're sort of scale is yeah f fairly consistent, and we can have a relationship with it. We're not quite as tall as something you quite disorientating that you can yeah, get Yeah, but now you change our relationship completely. Yeah, that's the plan. and would you want it to be quite big? Yeah, it will have to be big, yeah. 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 So I don't know what, and it'll be kind of, I think, maybe engineered on the outside, so kind of the working's visible, but then mm. this kind of slightly fantastical space inside. Wow. So okay. that's, the, that's the plan. Two very good answers. <laughs> well done. I've always got ideas. Always yeah, got sometimes ideas. artists just say to me, oh, I'm just looking forward to getting back to the studio and reading the paper for a bit. Yeah, that's I've got to do a bit of DIY as well, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, well done yeah. for hiding yeah. The, yeah. the less glamorous sides of an artist's mm -hmm. career. Um, 
Do we have any questions? From Martin? Question. Oh, lovely. In any instances of revising the work that you made, did you want to leave the revisions visible so that you could see what had been changed? Um, in what, how do you mean? So, well, if you, the, the idea is, as, if I understand it right, is that some of the work has been changed. Yeah. And presumably, in the process of changing, you had to kind of rough things up a bit and fiddle around with things. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to leave them so that there was evidence of the changes rather than refinish them and make them? I see what you mean. Um, I looked at that. I thought about doing it. So I sort of started, like you know, with the the pieces had all their welds visible originally. So I kind of ground those out. And part of the plan was maybe to just have that visible, that, that process, that change. But I kind of felt well, what's quite interesting is actually just having the photographs. Then you can see that's, that's there, that exists now as a piece. So you can see that. So there's evidence of the change. Yeah, yeah. So a, that's the only way you'd, you'd really know. And also the other thing that was really important was the, the date as well. So there's a kind of long, like the mm. seven years. And so that, that refers to it. And did you so. take pr photographs in progress? Uh, yes. Yeah. Before and afters. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> There's quite a few of those. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What would be the correct way of referring to inspiration in the case of the work you do? Is, so, is inspiration in the beginning of your work, or all true, or how can you say that you are inspired? You. How does it come into the discussion? How does it? How does it? Yeah. Um, I, so inspiration comes from nature and what comes from around me, really, I think. So generally, it's just from what I, what I experience in the world around me. So I kind of pick things. I, um, I, I collect it in my head, and it sort of just kind of stays there, basically, until I, until I come to make the work. Is that, I'm not quite clear on what your question is. I'm not sure if, in the case of conceptual art, you can speak about um, inspiration in the same way in which we speak when we think about Mozart, for example, oh, or something. So okay. I'm not quite sure if the inspiration is the right word in such Definitely. a Definitely. I think you can. Yeah, I think you can. So it's, a, it's about observation. It's about seeing, for me, it's noticing what's around me and kind of making a comment on that and using that. So. Definitely. And in, in a way, I don't think I'm a particularly, I think I'm a visual artist. I don't think I'm particularly, I have ideas, but I wouldn't call my work conceptual, really. I think it's, you know, I have, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you call it so. OK, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you for the overview, and I really ap appreciated the talk. Um, I had a couple questions. One is um, I see a lot of uh, essential minimalism in this. And so I'm quite curious to how would your art work um, if it was in the nature, but not in the woods or not in a structured uh, environment? Mm. How about have you ever thought about maybe um, in the sand? Maybe in the in the desert or great in question. the ocean. Let's all go to the desert. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> because it just looks amazing, the colors and everything, and then you know the juxtaposition between the colors and the texture to something else. Because I mean, it looks amazing in the woods, but I would love to hear your view on you know the other sides of nature's. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I just never really had the opportunity to do that, um, and I think something somewhere like a desert, which is this kind of you know, huge space would be really interesting to see what happens with scale um, mm. in that environment. So it's almost like I think sometimes I'm I'm kind of yeah I think it would change the work because quite often I'm I'm competing a little bit with what's around the work. So I'm always thinking about making something that kind of works with the environment but then holds its own as well. So yeah, I love I love all that that sort of American land art as well from the 70s and mm. that kind of the pureness and the scale of it I really really enjoy. So yeah. The second question is actually yeah. toward your philosophy. Um, I'm just thinking going forward, how would you transcend and evolve you know, from what you have now to um, maybe a higher level? It's similar to uh, her question, but I'm thinking more from a philosophical, inspirational level for yourself on the self-reflective through your art. Yeah. Um, what, what would be some of the directions that you'd be going to forward mm. to? Gosh. Um, from Nietzsche to Heidegger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, don't know, I, need to, I need to brush up on my philosophy for dummies, really, probably, I think. Um, but um, I don't know. I don't know. It's a very, it's a, I, I'm, I think I am interested in, in the kind of, um, I guess, the kind of complexity of the world. I'm interested in, in that things aren't really explained, that things aren't really um, you know, that easy to understand. And I kind of, I think I'm really, inter I'm interested in making, making work that, 
reflects that, I guess. But I don't know what philo philosophical movement that necessarily yeah, ties into. Yeah, so something, you know, looking at, you know, these works are all about kind of adding to and making it more complicated. So I'm quite interested in, in doing that and kind of making, you know, making work that sort of represents that. Would you say that you admit maybe the, the manifestation of your ideas has changed and you're, you know you've clearly got this compulsion to want to go back and change earlier works, but actually the way that you do it might alter and develop and move on and progress and go in different patterns, but fundamentally what you want to say is always going to stay the same? Like your philosophy, you could argue that an artist's philosophy would be relatively constant and yet the way that they manifest that is the thing that changes. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And I think actually looking back at um, earlier pieces, pieces I made 20 years ago, there's, a, there's similar concerns there. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a cyclical thing. I don't think it's something that, yeah. you know, so it will just keep, it just keeps kind of snowballing and just... Is there a danger that we'll be coming back here in 15 years' time and none of the works outside will exist in quite the same fashion? Possibly, possibly. <laughs> right, they might be all take, cut up and rebuilt. Take your photos tonight and spend your <laughs> yeah. time with them because he's not to be trusted. They're not necessarily finished, no. I don't think, yeah. Yeah, but, I like it. So. Uh, kind of continuing on from that, I was wondering what responsibility you felt, if any, to your own legacy as an artist, as you're sort of, this is something of a retrospective exhibition, but you are going back and essentially destroying previous works of art, and how you feel about what you're kind of leaving behind as your trail as an artist, and if you've ever given that any consideration. Um, I don't know, because so, I think that kind of whole thing is a bit so tied up with ego. That's for you to worry about. Yeah. The art dealer. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it is, yeah, I just, it's like the whole point about the, doing this, this show is actually it's almost I'm not caring. I'm just, you know, I, I, I care about the work, but I'm not concerned about the legacy of the work. I think when I'm making the work, it's important that it, it lasts and it's got this kind of, you know, the, the longevity to the way it's, to the way it's made. Um, and I'm joking about sort of, you know, keeping changing things. I may not, I may mm. move on and, and, and do something else, but um, I don't think I'm destroying it. I don't think I'm destroying it. I think I'm, right now, I feel I'm making it, I'm trying to make it better. I'm trying to kind of, you know, enhance I think that's it. That's exciting, I'm having practice it. Congratulations, mm. by the way, on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it, I'm quite interested in your idea of, I know you do a lot of appropriation, reappropriation, not really having anything perhaps as finished, and you just talked about the word finished, and it's a difficult subject for all artists because we all like to experiment and move things on. But I'm, I'm quite interested in perhaps how your work's moving into maybe a realm of sustainability, actually by reusing those materials and maybe for going to wood next. It's quite an exciting time, and yeah. I'm excited to see what might happen yeah. next. I think, um, I don't know if you agree, but I'm sure you do, that we have that kind of responsibility to to reuse things and actually, sorry, George. <laughs> Sometimes that's a really important part of our. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's a selling point, but there's also, as an artist, being true to the materials and actually wanting to remake something and revisit it, and actually that's the exciting point that you can actually destroy it and start again. So I totally get where you're coming from, and I'm just yeah. interested if you thought that perhaps that was a route you might go next with the. Possibly, I think goes. I mean, a much more. Yeah, I mean, I think as a as a as a industry, I think it's pretty. You know can be pretty wasteful, you know, um, as a sculptor. And I think um, I am becoming more aware of it and how do, you, how do you kind of deal with that? Because you're making something that's not really, that doesn't, it's not essential. And you're, you know, um, making it. It is, it's, it's, yeah, it's a kind of essential compulsion really, but yeah. Um, so I'm aware of it. And I think, yeah, part of the thing of working with wood was that these are all, you know, it's all been sourced from you know, kind of sustainable places and all of that. So wherever possible, I try and do it. But generally, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that it's not a, uh, you know. Um Okay, all right. No, uh, yeah, this, is a, this is a very sustainable exhibition. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, it's, I suppose something like 80% of stainless steel is recycled, so, mm. but it's just they kind of melt it and, you know, all the, yeah. the stuff that comes out of it. A lot of this it. is literally recycled. And it is literally recycled yeah. as well. Hmm. Can I ask a question about, um, I'm just thinking about the business lens here, so um, yeah. if you're changing your artworks, what's that saying about ownership, uh, sorry, about ownership and value, Yeah. which obviously are two ways in which business measures um, itself in, in the world, and I mean, in art, obviously, this is a key, key way in which artists uh, uh, in, uh, in relate to, to the buyers and, and sellers of their artworks, when, yeah. when they no longer have that direct access to it as well once it's no longer their own. 
piece yeah. of work. I think, well, I suppose because all the works that I've, I've re all the pieces that I've reworked in the exhibition are pieces that are, you know, I own, and then I've, I've kind of reworked them and, um, uh, you know, done it, done it that way. Um, I, yes, yeah, so I'm not, I mean, I don't think, because the other thing is I'm not, I think I'm enhancing them. So mm. I think I'm in, you know, therefore I think the value is increasing really, I suppose, whether that's got a price on it or whether it's something I feel is really, you know, more No, but I well. think that, I mean, fundamentally all value and sort of authenticity comes from the artist. Any real value comes from you, from you saying, this is a work of art that yeah. I, that I put my name to, that I love, that is a, you know, a convincing, to use that word again, Julian Wilde. Yeah. And so for you to go back and look at earlier work and have another conversation with them, I just think it just adds another layer, another dimension, another sort of level of interest. And I think it's interesting because I own a painting by a, an artist called Charming Baker and there was a pendant painting to it. Yeah. And he kept the other one and I have the other, this one. And in his latest show, he took the one that he owned and completely redid it. So okay. you could see an aspect of what was there originally and then they kind of reworked it. Really similar to what you've done, I suppose, this in conversation with himself. Yeah. And of course now I'm sitting looking at my one at home, knowing that this new one exists in the world, which has been totally transformed and kind of wondering and wishing if I could have mine like that now, because you kind of, I love the idea that art is static. Do you like the static. new one? Then? Yeah, like I like them both. I like okay. them both enormously. And I think what I'm really excited about is the idea that for an artist, art isn't static. For an art historian, I'm an art historian, art static. I yeah. put it in a book, I take a photograph of it, I talk about it. If I'm an art dealer, I sell it, and it becomes a product. But what's really, really exciting for me is when an artist sees their work and hasn't finished with it yet. Mm. It's, you know, there's still more to give. That's really great because I think it shows the sort of abundance of creativity and a generosity towards yourself mm -hmm. and a sort of a, a sort of a camaraderie with your earlier <laughs> yeah. sculpting yeah. self to say, oh, hey, actually, you know, I love the idea that you're literally talking out loud to your younger self in yeah. the studio. I don't know if you did. Um, <laughs> sort of weirdly, I think, yeah. Kind of, um, <laughs> Metaphorically. But it's not, it's not, you know, that's the thing. It's not something that's kind of frozen in aspect. Yeah. You know, mm. each time I show a piece of work, so these pieces will be kind of shown elsewhere probably yeah. and um, the context changes mm. and you know and therefore I change change something an element but it's of a powerful it, so. thing because only you have that it's a key that only the artist can hold yeah it's fun you know it's mm. kind of it's why I do it I enjoy this mm. you know that kind of playfulness I really enjoy mm. hi Julian hi <laughs> uh, great, great talk. Um, you talk. We've talked about conceptual art. And we talked about Caro, who I think mm. is one of your forefathers. Um, do you? See, we've talked about narrative. Do you see yourself in some kind of vindictory battle with conceptual modernism or conceptualism, like the YBAs, to revalidate modernism in the contemporary art scene? Um, I don't. Leading question. Gosh, yeah. Um, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a side of me that kind of, that kind of hates all that, in a way, the the sort of YBA thing, mm -hmm. the 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 kind of I think the, the kind of palatable conceptualism that that, that kind of represents, where it's a kind of neat a neat hook, um, it's about this that, kind of I think at the time when it was being made really got on my nerves, and I wanted to make something that reacted, to that. So I think I'm sort of trying to address sort of readdress what happened, you know, I'm really interested in 60s British sculpture and kind of, mm. you know, and it's become more popular again, you know, the sort of Philip King and Isaac Witkin and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but then actually now what I'm doing, I think is more about, there's more of a, um, uh, I've contextualized the work, I'm giving it more of a narrative. So it's changing again. So it's kind of, you know, there is more, it's more concept led now. So um, does that answer it? Well, Come on. <laughs> it's a longer conversation, Long really. Conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, going away from the conceptual account, um, I'm just interested in the surface of your sculptures. So they're all quite polished or reflective. <coughs> and I just wondered if how much of a decision that is practical, that it's just practical mm. if it's outside, and whether you've played at all with completely mad surfaces that, that, yeah. that sit back rather than reflect out. So um, the pieces in the corridor outside here are they're stainless steel as well and they're just um sanded so they're just kind of natural kind of well not natural there's not really a natural color for metal but they're, they're matte so i think it's always yeah thinking about the the uh, different ways that you can process the, sur the material and the surface and also the um what i call the semiotics of the material so the the kind of symbolism that that material has and how 
how you get the references it has. So, you know, these desks have got a bit of brushed stainless steel on them. And that has a whole, you know, that has a whole language, the handrail. You know, there's this, there's a kind of approach that you can have to the surface. And so previously I made a lot of pieces that were brushed steel because I wanted them to feel like they were part of the architecture or architectural detailing. And the polish, I think, is something like high mirror polish is something I always avoided. So it's not necessarily always the answer. Um, mm, and it's particularly for colour, actually, it's like when you apply colour. Yeah. Which is also, I know that you go to sort of satin, but, yeah. but not completely back, and I just wondered. Yeah, and the piece, the piece that I reworked, which is called Crowning the Fool, which is outside, has a bronze element on there, and that's different to the other bronze because it's got that brush surface, so I wanted it to kind of be kind of jewel-like, catch the light. Mm. It's a good sculptor question, though, that. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and then you've got this beautiful kind of red sculpture that's lit perfectly. Yeah. And it just felt like I wondered, you know, the amount of... You, you talk about um, putting something up and seeing what, seeing what happens. You know, how much control or how much, how much forethought were you thinking about placing these things in January in, in the depths of... English winter. Yeah, I mean, part of the world, so the title, Jane, is, you know, yes. relates to January, obviously, but, yes. um, uh, but, yeah, I think I was, you know, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the, the changes, so that actually this colour, and I think um, one of the things Lizzie men mentioned at the start was that it was about, you know, having colour in the, in, in, you know, at the, at the business school, so it's kind of like this kind of lifting thing in the winter months. But then also I'm really, I, you know, the works are about, they're kind of about the seasons as well. They're about cha nature changing and, um, you know, th that side of things. So th there's that, but then also the environment, I'm really looking forward to kind of coming back and seeing how it changes in the environment. Because when, so the first time I came here, it was just during the drought um, in the summer and the, the, the ground was like scorched <laughs> earth. It was just completely brown. And so coming back, it's green now and then we'll see all the, Changes around happening around it, so it's a kind of that's a lovely thing about sculpture outside, really, yeah, for me. Really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Me. Well, just want to say thank you. That was absolutely amazing. Really informative and articulate, and just brilliant insight to your practice. Thank, thank you, you, Kate, for leading the discussion. Um, what we're going to do now is we're, we've got the usual drinks outside, but we're also going to, um, Julie and I are going to take a tour of whoever wants to come uh, around the work um, so you can come outside and see, and see the work. So we're going to do that at seven, so have about ten minutes for drinking, and then yeah. whoever wants to can come with us, or if you want to stay up. drinking, yeah. you can stay drinking. So we'll just we'll take a group at about seven o'clock. Um, also, just to point to, out that we've got our next talk on the 14th of February with Philip Hoffman from the Fine Art Group, talking about the art of entrepreneurship, so put that date into your diaries and we have every Friday 12.30 to 1.15 um, curator tours with myself or Julian might be coming up at some point um, to also so if you can't come you know now when well, you can come back on a Friday but please do book in on Eventbrite um, but huge thanks thank you so much okay. Okay.